and welcome to another edition of the Sustainable Scoop. I wanted to report on the state of recycling in Arlington, Virginia. I'll start with the question on many people's mind. Why is glass no longer recyclable? I just have to say, glass is indeed recyclable. Uh, the first thing you should do is recognize that people who are talking, uh, not you personally, but people who are putting out that uh, zero waste includes incineration are just uh, crazy. Uh, recycling is the, as they would say in the old Soviet Union, uh, the, uh, uh, what's it called, the bedrock of the foundation of sustainability. And if you have an incinerator, you're destroying material. And in fact, your decision to shut down glass is really an insult to 40, 50 years of, of grassroots recycling. And what it's going to do is going to pollute more. Because when that glass goes into the incinerator, uh, it slags. You're going to have to use uh, some systems have to actually use dynamite to break up the slags. Glass in an incinerator is called a heat sink. It sucks energy out of, of the incinerator and it causes shutdowns and mechanical failures, etc. And considering that your incinerator is at least 30 years old, it could be longer than that, uh, that should be phased out. It should be a top priority if you're worried about breathing air. Uh, and you also are surrounded by the Lawton incinerator, uh, which is just adding to your problems. An incinerator generally impacts, uh, air pollution-wise, uh, generally impacts about 400 miles uh, in circumference around the incinerator. And when the ash gets put into the ground, the, the ground plume, the water plume underneath uh, in the soil, it will run 40 to 50 miles all around. So both from soil and air and water, you're, you're polluting. Yes, miss? Are those deposits, they aren't lined where they bury them? Yes, but all landfills leak. Uh, and and uh, the, the lining is two pieces of plastic, and you're putting garbage into it, and you're compressing it, so all landfills leak um, uh, sooner or later. Um, so, um, okay, what you need, uh, what, what you, the, the other thing that uh, I have no information on, uh, in terms of the numbers, I know what you're doing. You have single stream collection. It's the most inefficient, and depending, of, and and I have to assume that your processor is a lousy processor. I don't know who it is, whether it's government or private sector, because if they're not getting glass out, they're not processing recyclables correctly. And in fact, uh, there's a rule of thumb, the larger your processing system, the, 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 the worse your glass situation is going to be. And I can give you an example. DC, Baltimore, uh, possibly you here, I don't know, send their recyclables to Waste Management Inc.'s facility in um, Elkridge, Maryland. It's for DC, it's a 40 mile run, uh, which is incredibly expensive. Uh, and DC has to pay $25 a ton surcharge for glass. So the glass, they pay for shipping the glass, which is pretty heavy, 40 miles, processed, but the processing is not good enough, so the glass has to go into a landfill. So DC is paying $140 for recycling plus $25 for glass, and the glass goes into the landfill. So it's, uh, it's Kafkaesque, to say the least. Um, so, uh, I <laughs> just completed a project for the D.C. government, now I'm working in Baltimore, on what to do with glass. And there are many, many solutions. And in fact, the leading glass processes are tearing their hair out because the propaganda is that glass is invaluable and it's not worth recycling. It's just the opposite. Glass saves an incredible amount of energy. Uh, uh, glass uh, processing companies cannot get enough glass. Uh, because they feed four different industries. They feed the bottle industry, they feed the um, sandblast industry, they feed the glass insulation, and the construction industry. Uh, and these companies, the largest glass processes in the, countries are coming, in the country, are coming to D.C. and Baltimore and making them deals. Uh, the deal uh, for one of those cities is to reduce their cost uh, to less than $20 a ton uh, to get rid of glass. Now, Paying to get rid of glass, you think that's silly, but if you put glass in your incinerator or in your landfill, you're going to pay two or three times that much. Uh, so, um, uh, if I were in charge here, I would um, cancel the, uh, the, the, uh, the order to not recycle glass, and I would call these companies in and sit down and ask them what they offered D.C. and Baltimore. And uh, why not do the same thing here? You also have a glass processing facility in Fairfax which processes glass, it's a minimum processing, but it's uh, producing good materials for the construction industry. 
Uh, you guys are going to be in the middle of tons and tons of construction, given uh, what you're being inundated with. Uh, and that glass is extremely valuable, and it's a local homegrown product. Uh, glass is infinitely recyclable. The more uh, you know, keep on rubbing it, rubbing it, you get sand. Uh, and um, it's homegrown. Uh, you don't need China to recycle it. It's too expensive to move. Same thing with compost. So if you focus on your, your composting and your glass, right there you're going to get 50% of your waste rate. I don't think you have to worry about paper. Uh, there are 17 paper mills being uh, built in the country right now, all throughout the southeast and, and the Midwest. Um, there's more investment in, in paper recycling, plastic recycling, and ele electronic scrap recycling now than in the last 20 years, all because of China. Uh, China is a blessing. Uh, they're, they're ending the system that, that uh, stopped recycling in the United States. If you look at the statistics, when the grassroots movement started, recycling started going like this, and it topped off at about 33, 34 percent, and it's been stagnant for a decade, mainly because of big waste. Big waste uh, could not deal with the increase in recycling because they're, they're losing a fortune. They make 60 to 70 percent of their profit on landfill. They make nothing on recycling. They had to recycle because people like you changed the laws over the last 40 years and required recycling. Just about every major city mandates recycling. Uh, they had to stop it. They got warnings from Wall Street. Recycling is going to drive your, your stock prices down. And the only way big waste expanded and made profits is to use their stock to buy up the smaller companies. They if continue to squelch recycling by their single stream systems. They build systems processing like Elkridge that uh, run 1,000 tons per day. Uh, ex yeah, 1,000 tons per day, about 20, 30,000 tons uh, per month. And those systems just don't work. They're, 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 they're too big. Uh, waste management doesn't care about quality. They just want to push material through because whatever comes out is garbage, they put in their landfill for free, including DC's glass, which they use for road beds and, and daily cover. Um, so there are many aspects of what's going on that are so uh, structurally fundamental that you're not addressing here that you really do need a workshop for citizens to find out what's going on around the country and what citizens are doing and what um, cities are doing to drive market development. Everyone mm. talks about uh, Depending upon a, a waste company to do your recycling, you're screwed because they don't care. They, they don't make money on recycling. They make money on landfilling and burning garbage, although burning garbage, uh, they can't do that anymore because citizens shut down 400 uh, efforts. They've also shut down existing plants. What's happening now, however, is that where there's another threat, Hefty and Dow Chemicals are building plants just to burn plastic. Plastic is, the, is you do not want to be burning plastic. Um, plastic has a whole list of uh, <laughs> additives. Uh, the, the list of what they put in the plastic, from, it's not just the plastic polymer. Yeah. And you know, you could take a piece of plastic, you could take a soda bottle and lick it, it's not going to bother you. But if you burn it, it's going to uh, volatize all that stuff and you're going to be breathing it. Um, so, uh, a hefty and Dow, if they succeeded, uh, if succeed, they have two cities already that they brought into their system. Uh, they're going to keep up, uh, keep burning plastic, and keep producing plastic. The plans for producing virgin plastic are expanding rapidly because of the low cost of, of natural gas, which is very dangerous because natural gas is a, is is a very sticky problem because of the leakage. Every natural gas system leaks about 20 to 30 percent of its system, including the, the systems that take uh, uh, gas out of landfills. Natural gas is a very, very dangerous uh, uh, substance, and it has to be controlled, but it's not. Uh, it's not because um, uh, people think they can recycle their way out of the plastic dilemma, but they can't. The plastic is made from oil, which is the fuel that's destroying the world, and plastic is destroying the ocean uh, from where we get life. So um, you've got to stop plastic uh, from proliferating, and you have to stop burning it. And you're not doing that here. Uh, so you could go to your DPW uh, in the county, and they'll tell you you're at 50%, you're doing great, and you're going to have 90%, including incineration. That's greenwashing. Including incineration in a zero waste system uh, plan is greenwashing. And I could give you examples of how industry has done that. In 1969, when the garbage crisis hit, 
the garbage crisis hit earlier, but in 1969 we found out about it because of everything that happened in the 60s with the environmental consciousness. So industry had to do something because um, uh, you had to control garbage and it was growing like crazy. So they started the National Center for Waste Disposal, which meant building incinerators all over the country. Um, and within months they had to change the name and it became the National Center for Resource Recovery, uh, which sounds terrific, but it's burning garbage. It happened again a few years later when uh, Barry Commoner and uh, Charlie Gunnarsson from the World Bank, Barry Commoner was, a, is an independent, was an independent scientist, and they came up with the term integrated resource recovery, which meant, uh, they were mostly talking about third world countries, but including the United States, that uh, garbage management has to be integrated into the economic, social, and environmental needs of the community. Well, the incinerator industry wouldn't have that, so integrated uh, resource recovery meant you integrate landfill, incineration, and some recycling. Again, uh, greenwashing, when you hear resource recovery, gee, that's a wonderful thing, but not if you're burning the stuff and not if you're putting it in the landfill. So, um, I know uh, time is short, so I will conclude by saying that what you need is someone, an independent person, to come in and give an evaluation, do an audit. Uh, usually, we call it a voids audit. What are the best cities in the, and counties in the country doing that you don't have here? What's your void here? And then you figure that out, and you cost it, and you plan for implementing it. Um, implementing uh, uh, maximum, and comprehensive, if you will, uh, uh, recycling, composting, reuse um, is absolutely necessary for your community. It's necessary for the earth. Uh, we can't keep on consuming plastic and, and burning, but you're very far away from where you have to get, which is at least the doubling of what you're doing now. And you can only do that through tried and true uh, uh, methods that have been done in other cities and have been cost effective. One other thing, uh, again, I don't know who's processing your material. You can process single stream material correctly uh, if it's the right size, 300 to 400 tons per day. If you go to 1,000 tons per day, you're lost. Two cities, um, twi well, three cities, Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and um, Boulder have single stream systems that are recovering glass. DC will have one in about a month. There's a, a plant, a processing plant opening up in Prince George's County within a mile from the district. Uh, that will be able to recover glass. So if you're not recycling glass, you have the wrong processor. Uh, and if you, if you can't budge your, system, your powers that be to get a new processor, then you have to take glass out of the single stream system, um, which they've done by fiat, but they haven't done anything to replace it. Baltimore, uh, there's, there's a, a new company being formed in Baltimore just for glass. Um, as I said before, the industry is running around trying to sign up cities to get glass, and there's a strategy for it. Uh, there are two forms of glass comes from the commercial waste stream, bars and restaurants, uh, and of course from households. So one strategy would be uh, to give an exclusive contract to one company to pick up glass from every restaurant and bar. I assume it's uh, commer uh, 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 commercial establishments are mandated to recycle in the, in the county. Um, if not, you, you have to get that uh, passed. Uh, and by giving a company uh, uh, exclusive rights to get the commercial glass where they, they can make money, uh, they would be obligated to set up systems uh, for residential, both drop-up and collection. And the, the biggest uh, glass company in the, in the country is already doing this in Houston and other places. So um, my uh, suggestion to you is, um, you cannot be satisfied. Um, you have to protect yourself with these laws and, and strategies. If you can't get single stream done right, go back to dual stream. It's cheaper anyway. And, and there are big, uh, big corporate funds that uh, you can apply to to, to uh, pay for that transition. Um, so you need, uh, you need someone to come in and, and do a report. I'm not advertising for myself. I'm busy enough. But I can give you the list of excellent grassroots consultants like Jim here on C&D, uh, Rick Anthony and Gary Liss and Ruth Abbey. Uh, Brenda Platt is, uh, does work for the Institute. She's our uh, compost person. Uh, and you need distributed composting, backyard, community, 
and then citywide. But your citywide uh, facilities should not be more than 300 tons per day because after that, uh, compost processing just breaks down. Uh, I don't, you probably need two 300 ton facilities uh, in, your, in your county. Again, I have not gone through the numbers. I did go through your solid waste management plan. There were so many inconsistencies, I, I just didn't have time to, to dig into it, and I won't because I'm not working here. But you need to get someone to show you how to protect yourself uh, because at this point, you're at the mercy of uh, the DE, whatever they call it here, your solid waste management system, which is in love with the incinerator, and you've got to break up that affair. You need regional material, uh, regional cooperation is on an industrial park. Uh, you need an industrial park exclusively for recycling, composting, and reuse companies. I haven't talked about reuse, but reuse is the most important thing you could do if you want to create jobs. You can create jobs that keep people out of jail. It trains people, gives them decent pay. It gives them social, excuse me, social services. And you could reduce recidivism from the national average of 75% to 25%. And you just calculate the cost of one person not going back to jail, not committing crimes, which the government doesn't pay for, we pay for, uh, when uh, we get robbed and someone hits us over the head, etc. So the reason to do this is not for the environment, although it certainly is good for the environment, it's for your social, it, it's for your social stability, it's for your social yeah, fabric. Of, hmm, the other, well, there, there are many other issues which uh, there's just not enough time to get into, but it all fits around the fact that you folks, you, uh, can control the raw material flowing through your, your system. You could create jobs from it, you could stop the pollution from it. But you can't leave it up to the DPW. Uh, in some cities you can, uh, because they're on board. They're the new generation, they're the new paradigm thinkers. But in most, you're dealing with people who love incineration because it's so convenient. You don't have to do anything different. And no one sees what's coming up, uh, going out. And you need constant monitoring. You, you should talk to Mike Ewall, Energy Justice Network. He will tell you the technology that's available to have constant monitoring of that incinerator, plus putting it on, uh, on your TV screen so everybody could see what's coming out of that, that system. And it will get you angry. Uh, it will certainly get you angry. And if you're old or young, you're, you're in danger. Uh, uh, I think it's $53 million a year that Baltimore pays for kids uh, going to the emergency room for asthma. And NO, what is it, NOx is the leading uh, aggravator of, of asthma in, in people. So um, garbage is, uh, is more than just what you put uh, in your garbage or recycling can. It really is the basis of sustainability. If you can't uh, deal with your waste properly, uh, you cannot have a sustainable community. Single-use plastics, uh, which is happening, as you know, but the best thing for source reduction is actually has nothing to do with uh, the materials. It has to do with the collection system. Use unit pricing. Charge people for the amount of garbage they put on the, the curb. Do not charge them for the recycling or the composting they put out on the curb. And you will see a 40% reduction in your waste within one year. This statistic has been tried. Uh, there are 2,000 communities in the country that use real uh, pay-as-you-throw unit pricing. There are 5,000 that attempt it, but there are really just about 2,000. Each of those 2,000 cities, uh, you could read the statistics, 40% reduction because of increased recycling, increased composting, and changing purchasing habits. People, if they're paying for, for what they put out, they don't bring things in their house that they're going to have to pay to get rid of. It's uh, kind of like you don't open your windows and put on the heat in the middle of December. It doesn't make sense, and you're going to pay for it. Same thing with not uh, fixing the leaks in your, your water heater or whatever, you know, water. Uh, these are precious uh, energy, water, these are pre garbage, these are precious things, and you have to control them. And the best way to control them in this society is, um, is, uh, is through uh, charging. It's not true of every society. You go to Italy, uh, a bunch of anarchists, so they do it right. Uh, they have eight different things. You don't have to give them incentives. It, if there's anyone in Italian here, you could verify what I'm saying. I grew up in an Italian neighborhood, so I feel <laughs> Second Chance is taking down houses here. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. I get all my wife's Christmas presents at Second Chance. They've got wonderful old stuff. Uh, and uh, 
they, I would talk to them about setting up a satellite operation here, um, just to give you one sense of what a, how important they are to the city of Baltimore. We trained their first uh, six workers in 2003, and they got this incredible warehouse for free from the city in exchange for every time they have a new job opening, it has to come from the welfare rolls, now called TANF rolls, uh, hard to employ, low income people. Um, they, they recruit the, if there's job opening, they recruit these people, it's a 10 week training program for which they get paid. If they don't screw up, they get a guaranteed job with health insurance. 170 workers now work at Second Chance, up from six, 13, 16 years ago, plus they have a goal. 20, they look for 20% of their uh, employees, employees to get a better job every year uh, because they're in the, in the business of materials, but they're also in the people business. Sir. While DC just launched Sustainability Goals 2.0, it seems Arlington is walking back from shared commitments of zero waste and are going in the wrong direction. We need to develop a circular economy. Government should be guiding businesses, businesses educating citizens, and schools, all schools, should be composting. Together, we need to educate ourselves on what investments need to be made to support sustainable resource management.